You're listening to Answering the Call, the official podcast of the 12th Man Foundation. Our show provides listeners with an insider perspective of Texas A&M Athletics and its greatest supporters. This podcast will bring you exclusive interviews with coaches, athletes, donors, and the dedicated staff of Aggie Athletics and the 12th Man Foundation. You ready? Let's dive into today's episode. Welcome back to Answering the Call, the official podcast of the 12th Fan Foundation. This is your host, Ivy Robinson, and today I'm sitting in studio with Aggie Volleyball Head Coach Jamie Morrison. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Coach Morrison. Yeah, my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me here. To begin, Coach Morrison, can you tell us where you're from? And maybe, let's do this, maybe a fun fact about yourself. Uh, Where I'm from, I'm originally from Southern California. Born and raised in that area, so I uh, grew up in the Dana Point, San Clemente area of Orange County, for those people that know it. And uh, fun fact, I'm a really good snowboarder. Really? Um, and I think it's the thing, I, I'm all equally, if not better, than volleyball at it. And it's just something that I enjoy. It's my meditation. It's my way of getting away. And I'll go down some runs where if I'm not thinking about what I'm doing and my brain goes to volleyball and how to side out, all of a sudden I'm going to hit a tree. So it's a little bit therapeutic for me too if it's my place to kind of go meditate and be away from other thoughts. Do you have a favorite place to snowboard? There's one run called Dead Man's Leap on the backside of Vale and you have to drop down like a 10 or 15 foot like drop to get into it so nobody does it and it's just there's always powder goes through some trees at the bottom and then you can I can just do that run over and over it's like literally like my therapy when I'm trying to go to bed at night uh, Ryan our sports psychologist he used golf I use snowboarding as my thing to like go through this run so I fall asleep and I envision that run over and over again really yep. see that sounds like a total adrenaline rush oh, obviously yeah. like you love the, the thrill of it yeah. yeah I think maybe all coaches have that a little bit yeah. like, uh, otherwise I don't like this is hard and I think the reason I, for we do it, we have to be on the edge. I think that's interesting because uh, to me, that sounds like not something I would oh, do yeah. for therapy at all. But it's so interesting to see like what individuals enjoy doing to like get their mind off of yep. things. Different people have their different things. Yeah. So for me, uh, I do like finding thrills in the world. I like, I was actually just listening to a podcast on awe and just like when we open ourselves up to that, to something that's greater than us, whether it be something that we're doing or something that we see, and it creates happiness. So for me, uh, that extreme side of things is a piece of it. Very cool. So, Coach Morrison, can you share about your path and journey to the game of volleyball specifically? Yeah. I often share with young coaches just, I think to this day I have an imposter syndrome for this reason, but just uh, I started off at UC Santa Barbara in California kid, and I was there, and I I was the kid that didn't know about recruiting, so I called the head coach, and I was like, hey, can I come play for your team like five days before school started? And he's like, yeah, sure, come on and hang out for a little bit. So I lasted, I don't know, longer than most. I think I lasted four months, something like that, and then I got cut, and then the women's team needed a practice player to go practice against them. So I was like, sure, I, I like this game. I love this game and I want to keep playing. So I said yes to that. And then all of a sudden it turned into a volunteer assistant position. And I put that myself through school. I was volunteer assisting. I was a teaching assistant in the economics and accounting department. And then I was working at Outback Steakhouse for a piece of that, just trying to pay my tuition. And I remember having this thing that was cool. And I was walking from practice to a TA session when I was going with a group of 30 students. And I was looking over at the practice gym and I'm like, I'm never going to make it in the sport. Like no one's ever going to want someone that got cut from their volleyball team. I don't have this name brand or these things. And I think it's also a piece of why I got good. I was always like, I felt like an underdog that I had to learn. I had to go pick up these things that other people didn't have. And so I worked my way through school. And uh, again, I kind of with this vision of this is cool, it's fun, it's a hobby, but I didn't see it necessarily being a profession, but I loved it. And I kept doing it just for that reason. It wasn't, I wanted something out of it at the end. It was just, I loved that team. I loved that program and I wanted to see it through. So they asked me to stay on one extra semester at the end. And I did as a volunteer. And then um, my plan was to go off into the accounting world. I was this close to becoming an accountant. Really? And uh, I was near the top of my class in the accounting department and I had an offer from an accounting firm and I was literally about to put pen to paper and I got a call from Mick Haley at the University of Southern California and he was like, hey, before you do that, just come talk to me. We all have these people in life that have changed your life. Mine is a woman named Liz Town Gilbert. While I was at UC Santa Barbara, she was the assistant there and she was the one that kind of brought me in as a practice player and then was like, hey, do you want to come in as... Uh, a volunteer and then like like helped me get an internship with the 49ers in their public relations department. And then she ended up taking the assistant coaching job at USC and literally my life would not be what it is right now. And the other one, just, I always teach all of my assistants as at the time, she wouldn't let me pay for anything either. And I was angry at, sometimes I would sneak it in and she would look at me and just say, hey, Jamie, one day you're going to be in a position to pay this forward. That's going to be your payment to me. So I, again, eternally grateful. She ended up going to USC and Mick Haley sat down and he's like, Hey, we'll pay for your MBA. And will give you a salary and you'll have this dual position with the men's program and the women's program and 
I was like, I can't turn down a free MBA. So uh, I got hired in August. The school had already started. So, all right, so next year I'm going to start this MBA. So I started getting ready for all the tests and things that go into that. And then that next summer, I got a call from the national team being like, hey, we'd be interested in, in you trying out for this position. And the other lesson I tell young coaches all the time is like, I was lucky, quote unquote, as I'm throwing up finger quotes here, but I was in the right place at the right time with the right skill set that someone couldn't live without. And I just tell people, whether it be business world or whether it be the volleyball world, get really good at something that people can't live without. And for me, it was the video and statistics side of things. And I didn't realize it as, again, I was just at Santa Barbara and somebody handed me a laptop and I just, I go down rabbit holes of trying to learn things. And I was like, I want to be the best at this. So I taught myself and all of a sudden I didn't realize it, but I was one of the best in the world at what I did. And uh, it opened up that door of the national team and I got offered a two week trial at first. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call being like, Hey, like I've done my digging here. Like I want to hire you in this position. And uh, again, Liz Town Gilbert, Hugh McCutcheon, the two people that changed my life. Hugh, Hugh McCutcheon was the head coach of the national team at that time. So um, I joined the national team, basically just taking care of video and statistics at first. And then I was put around some of the best coaches and players in the world. And I think both of them taught me a lot. And with the national team, it's awesome because like, I remember my second quad and I spent four years and I skipped this part on accident. My assistant coaches tell me I can't anymore. We want a gold medal at the end of that quad. And I remember we looked at each other and we're like, of course, we worked harder than anybody else in the world. Like, when I think those results come with that. So Hugh decided to go over to the women's side and I went with him and both of those quads. And I just, the story I remember vividly is I was in Montreux, Switzerland and when you're with a national team, everyone thinks it's glitz and glamour and all these things. And like our players will have nicer facilities here at Texas City at the NM than they will if they go to an Olympics. But I remember me and Russ Rose, who was the head coach at Penn State, legendary. Like uh, he won three national championships in a row at one time, like one of the names in our sport that everybody knows. And him and I were roommates. And I don't think Russ had ever shared a room with anybody for the last like 20 years of his career. But I just remember we were just sitting there at night getting ready for bed. We're laying in bed and he started talking to me about, hey, what are you guys teaching passing? And I started talking to him about culture and like that, I don't know, two week or 10 day trip, it just exemplifies the national team for me because it was just constantly the rust roses of the world were popping through our gym and they were asking us questions and I got to ask them questions. And it was just this formulation of ideas that started getting into my head of this is what coaching should be. And if I take over a program one day, this is how it should look like. And again, those experiences changed my life. So I got to the end of that quad and Hugh went and took over the University of Minnesota as the head coach there. And the other assistant that I was working with was Karch Karai, who's one of the legends of our sport, um, probably the greatest player of men or women's to ever play it. And he was taking over as the head coach of that team. And he was like, hey, I want you to be my assistant. And I stepped away for a little bit to be an assistant in college. And then Karch called back and he's like, hey, I really want you to do this. And I couldn't say no to another Olympics. So three Olympics went by. I won a gold, a silver, and a bronze. And Kim, my wife, likes to tell me that I got worse with time. But I like to tell people just winning a medal is really, really hard at the Olympics. Absolutely. And at the end of that i was sitting on the bench after the olympic semifinal, and we had lost for people that don't know our sport it's best of five so you can win three zero you can win three one you can win or lose three two and uh the fifth set goes to 15 so the rest of the sets are 25 fifth sets 15 i think if i remember correctly we lost 17 15 in the fifth set of the olympic semifinal. and i was sitting there on the bench and again going through my head man i'm winning a medal i'm winning a gold medal is really really hard because i thought we had done everything right the culture was amazing all these things were going and so i was sitting there just thinking about that and then i was also just caught up on this like i just went through arguably the most pressure-filled situation in our sport olympics you spent four years for this moment you were here and i didn't feel like my heart rate went over 80. and i was just like man what is wrong with me and i'm going back again adrenaline junkie. I there push myself a lot. Yeah. So there, there was a piece of me like, am I too comfortable being uncomfortable? And I remember a sports psychologist, cause I was sitting there just kind of in this quandary and it wasn't crying. It wasn't sad. It was just sitting there thinking, staring ahead. And a sports psychologist sat down next to me and he's like, you okay? And I just went over both of those and we went over the first one. He's like, I understand it. And he's like, when he went over the second one and he was basically just like, Hey, at some point you're ready for the next step. Like you're ready to be pushed to the next way that you can. And that's being a head coach. And I remember sitting there being like, it has to happen at some point. Like, and I, I tell, I don't know, there's a lot of assistant coaches, a lot of people that are probably younger, they're like, I'm ready, I'm ready. There's oftentimes you're not ready. And I think the time when like, you're not, I don't know, stressed by things, you're not pushed as much as you had been, like you're ready for that next step. Because once you make that jump, and I can get into that in a second, it's a huge jump. Mm -hmm. You get pushed in ways you weren't even thinking were humanly possible. But Karch and I talked, he wanted me to come back and I was just, I, I couldn't promise four years was the biggest thing. And he wanted a four year commitment and I'm big on honesty and integrity. And I was like, I, I couldn't look him in the eye and be like, yeah, man, I want a job. And I just told him like flat out, Hey, I'm happy to do it. But if the right opportunity comes up, I need to leave. And if that means I need to leave now, I totally understand. And he wanted a four year commitment. And like, we literally, I felt like I was like, breaking up with someone that like I'd been together in a relationship, but neither one of us wanted to leave for like right. 10 years. I can and imagine that's 
difficult. Yeah, and, and it was hard. And we were staring at each other. I think we both got off the phone. We were teary, and like, it was the first time in my career that I'd never known the next step. Like again, I, I went from like volunteer to like somebody wanted me, and then this wanted me, and this wanted me, and I'm like, I'm unemployed. And at the time, I was spending the national team season with the national team, and I was coaching in Turkey um, with Vakit Funk, which is one of the, the top clubs in the world. So I was in Turkey, and I had this thing kind of until I don't know May. And I, I, like, this was on December. We were having this conversation. And I'm like, I'm unemployed in five months. And it was scary. And then uh, I got a call from the Dutch national team. And the coach I was actually working with in uh, Vakit Funk, he left the Dutch national to go coach Turkish. And they called. They said, hey, Gio left one name in terms of the person that should fill this spot. And it's you. And we'd like to have a conversation. And they ended up narrowing it down to two coaches. And I flew to the Netherlands. And I vividly remember the person that hired me is still one of my best friends. And we talk about it. Like sitting in the, there was a meeting room in the airport, the Amsterdam airport. And uh, kind of went over my vision for the program, and I ended up taking over the Dutch national team for three years. It was one of the coolest experiences, and again, stretched in ways I didn't even think were humanly possible from going being an assistant to a head. We finished fourth at World Championships, which is the hardest probably tournament. Everyone looks at the Olympics, but World Championships is harder because you get 24 teams and kept that team where it was. And then after that, I was doing nothing for a little bit, working in North, well, nothing for a tiny bit. I got stuck in New Zealand. Another fun story we can talk about for six months during COVID. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, we can get into that one at a different time when I'm not talking about life story. And then uh, I started working for League One Volleyball and uh, working on the business side of growing. Um, and again, the sport I just talked about is giving me everything. It's giving me my profession, my family, my love, my friends. Like I was working with them to get professional volleyball going in the United States and put the backbone of what that looks like. And they're actually going to start that league next year. And uh, it, it was this cool way for me to give back. But I got to the end of that and I missed coaching. I missed making an impact on young people's lives. I missed building culture. Mm -hmm. um, I missed all of those things that come along with it. So Kim and I sat down and uh, I was slowly becoming less of myself because I wasn't doing what I felt like God put me on this planet to do. And we put together a laundry list of like, hey, if we're going to go coaching college, these are the things that have to happen. And Texas A&M was the one that checked the most boxes. And it was this fit that I think worked out on both sides because I think they were pretty happy with my vision when I came in here and presented it. And here I am. So you are. sorry for the four minute monologue there. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the moment you mentioned you and Kim sat down and yeah. you decided, I want to be developing the next generation, young players, young athletes. And we both know Texas A&M is a very special place. Yep. And I'm sure a lot of factors went into that decision. Tell us specifically what it was about this university, the athletic department, yeah. that made you come here. I think, there were one, there's things that got checked off that happened because of what Texas A&M is. But I don't think I realized how powerful they were until I came to Texas A&M. And I'll get to that in a second. The initial stuff was, one, I wanted a place where the resources match the expectations. So I wanted to be in a place that wanted to win championships. I didn't want to be in a place that was okay with mediocrity. Or they just come in here and hang out. Like I wanted to be in a place where I came in and they said, we want to win the SEC. We don't need to do it every year. Uh, you're not going to be evaluated on that and be let go if you don't every single year. But we want to be in contention to win the SEC. And that was number one that I wanted to hear. The backside of that where I can, I, and I just encourage people, if you're going through a job interview, like you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. So I fired back with, all right, like you want to be here. What are you doing to match that? And they showed me the budget. They walked me around and showed me the resources. They showed me the academics, uh, resources that our athletes have. They gave me the vision for what Clark would be. Uh, and it was, we want to match that by doing this. Here's your practice facility. And I'm like, all right, like you want high things and you're willing to back it. Cause the hardest piece is if you're in a place that's like, we want to win, but you're last in resources. And you're like, they, these two things aren't matching. And it's really hard as a coach. So that was one of the things. Second thing is I wanted a place that could balance academics and athletics. I didn't have a great freshman. I got wrapped up in everything that comes along with college. And I had a 2.2 .2 and then I had a 4.0 after that. But school was really, really important to me. I, I realized that if I'm doing my job right, I'm, I'm going to produce three Olympians in my career. Hopefully I'm producing a bunch of other people that maybe want to go off and play professionally and do some stuff for four or five years, but everyone is going to be end up, end up doing something other than being an athlete at some point in their career. And me, again, I think one of the interesting things is that I have perspective on this and I try to get this across to our athletes and how lucky and blessed we are in the United States. We are the one country in the world uh, that I know of, and there might be another one somewhere out there where our athletes get to go to school at the same time as they get to be an athlete. And if you're in Europe, and again, when I was in the Netherlands, a lot of stuff made sense. The one thing that didn't make sense at 15 years old, you're having to make a decision between being a sportsman or a sportswoman or going to university. And I had 30-year-old athletes that had been to two Olympics and all done all these things that were scrambling at 30 years old to try to get an education while they were still playing volleyball. And just the wow. fact that we get to do both is huge. So for me, it was a place that I can balance those two things where 
And I, I think the school does an amazing job of doing that, of, I think, I don't know, encouraging, hey, we want to have athletic excellence, but at the same time, hey, we trust you as a head coach to make sure that this stuff is balanced. So that was two. Um, and I'm trying to think through the, the list of stuff. Uh, uh, the resources, like I always tell in the recruiting process, one of the bougiest things that I had was like, I wanted to be in a place that we could charter. And the outwardly one is I wanted our students to be able to go to class the next day and not have to sit through an airport and sit there and miss three days of class instead of missing one day of class. And for me, the reason was, is I was starting a family and I wanted to be around my family. And this job is really, really hard, it takes you away from your family. And the more you can either A, take them on the road with you, which chartering allows. But I remember our, vividly our first trip was to Arkansas and we played at two o'clock and I was talking to Kim afterwards and she's like, uh, should I put Andy to sleep tonight? I'm like, no, I'll be home to put her to bed. And like our, both of our minds were blown in that instance of realizing I'm going to be home by 7.30 to put my kid to sleep. And that's a huge deal. And then the other one, that was a big one. And again, this one got checked off by the spirit of the 12th man, but I didn't know about it, was just I wanted to be in a place where people cared. I wanted to be in a place where people cared about athletics. I wanted to be in a place, and again, I was off working for love at the time, growing the sport and doing the thing that I think is going to push the sport to the next level because there's a tidal wave coming with volleyball right now. Like popularity is growing in terms of participation. People are watching. They had 800,000 people tune into an ABC game that was on a weekend. It is going to blow up. And there's a tidal wave coming, and I wanted to be one of the people that was helping push it there. And that's what I was doing with League One. And I wanted to be in a place, and this is what I interviewed them on too, of like, are they going to help me push that wave further? The 12th Man production studio that we're sitting in right now, like this was actually one of the tipping points for me being here was like, I can build a brand. I can help push the brand of volleyball. We can do some things that are unique and different that other universities can't do. We can tell stories about our athletes. We can do all of these things that make this place pretty unique, and I can help push this title wave further. And then I'd been around, I don't know, playing at World Champions where World Championships, where there's 15,000 Japanese fans with thunder sticks going in the crowd. And like, I've been at schools and I won't name names to throw anybody under the bus, but I've been at schools where you've been like number one, number five in the country and there's 500 people that show up. And I'm like, these two, this is not what our athletes want to play in front of. It's not aligning. It's not yeah. matching. Yeah. And uh, for me, I, I always tell the story. I, I did coach at the other school in Texas and I was working remotely because I was coaching professionally with Athletes Unlimited. And, uh, Texas came here and Texas was ranked number one. Texas A&M was not ranked and 6,000 people showed up. And I remember looking at this being like, man, like what happens when this reaches the tipping point of Texas A&M is good. You could sell out Reed. And that was just this, like, Absolutely. I have my eyes wide right now. Cause at the time I was just like, man, like this thing is a gold mine waiting to happen of people being interested in the athletics in general that will pull people in that can get people interested in what I think is one of the most beautiful and graceful sports in the world that can help this tidal wave. And for me, that was the giant check mark. Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't know exactly why. It's just, you can see it from the outside and everyone always says, once you get here, like you feel it, like it's different when you get here. And again, since I've gotten here, all of those things have grown into, I feel like I'm the luckiest coach in the world that picked this thing for the right reasons, but they've just been amplified so much more since I've been here. The twelfth man, the spirit of the twelfth yeah. man. It's that saying, like from the outside looking in, yep. you can't understand it, and from the inside looking out, you can't explain it. Nope. It's truly incredible, and I'm glad you brought up that, and that it was a factor in your decision. The support, the fans, the fan base of the twelfth man here. I mean, twelfth man foundation donors and season ticket holders. They are a huge part of that fan base, and yep. also a huge foundation to providing the resources for our student athletes here. So, if they're listening right now, what would be your message to them? Thank you. Like uh, gratitude is a core tenant of our program. It gets a birthplace to happiness. So I try to express it as much as I can, but this isn't uh, like, I'm just throwing this out there. Like I'm going to go first on the atmosphere standpoint. We played Texas. We had 9,232 fans. If I remember, it's close to that number. I remember we set a record for the highest attendance in the state of Texas for a regular season game. Yes. The number is the number. It's fine. It's the feeling. And I talked to our athletes last year when we got to the end of the year and I was going into a recruiting cycle. I'm like, Hey, what should I be selling? And the facilities were brought up a little bit. The most unanimous thing that got said is the feeling you get at a home game when you come into our gym right now. And that is growing exponentially. Again, I haven't been in an environment like that. I've been to Olympics. I said this 15 different times over the last week. When you get to Olympics, there's different people pulling for different countries and the people that are just watching volleyball. I've never been in front of a crowd where it's like, these people are here for us. You can feel it. You can feel it being against them. You can feel when we do something well, we're celebrating. You got 9,000 friends behind you. And it was a different feeling. And my biggest level of gratitude is for showing up and showing out and for being a piece of that and not just, I don't know, sitting there and hanging out at a volleyball match, but for participating and making us feel the people that were in the gym. And I know there's a lot of people that are probably listening to a podcast that were a piece of that. 
And my encouragement is if you haven't been a piece of it, also come in the future. If you did love that, come again. Our season tickets, we were just talking about this, like we need, like they're not expensive right now. And I think we're building one of the most fun experiences of being a part of. So if you haven't been to a volleyball match, come out. We're playing some music. We're doing some stuff for the big screen. We have a DJ in the crowd. We have some crowd participation when we get a block. It's fun. Flip side of it, I think the two sides, there's maybe, I don't know, individual donations to our program. I don't think I've been at a place, and I think I've been at four colleges where people are more willing to help out to the point where uh, we have a Maroon Club event. If anybody's interested in being part of that too, please reach out. But uh, we have about four events a year where I'll get back and do a chalk talk before a match. And we'll talk about a scouting report. This last time I talked about how we try to keep our athletes healthy with technology, but just giving people an inside look into what's going on. And the first question, I'm like, all right, questions are like, what else do you need? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, and they're like, literally put together a Christmas list. What else do you need? We're here to help. And it's just the willingness to go out and help in that way has been amazing towards our program. And then I said it before, I've been a part of national teams. The resources that we have, they're better than most. When I was in the Netherlands, we had Poppendal, which is an amazing Olympic training center. And I was actually just sitting at Clark Nutrition Center the other day, just looking around. I don't know why, just that building compared to the temporary building. And I'd never seen what Slocum looked like before. So it just gave me this feeling of being back at that national team training center, of having all of these elite athletes in there interacting in different ways. And it's become like this kind of place where everyone gets to see each other because we all have our own amazing facilities. But the academic center that we have now, like our athletes love the space and they're going there to study. And it's nice having a place that they love to go opposed to a place that they're forced to go. And all of these facilities are just adding up into this amazing experience that our student athletes have that they're never going to forget for the rest of their life. And again, my hope is that 5%, 10%, 5%, 10%, I mean, let's go 50%, let's throw it out there. If they want to go play professionally, that our athletes have the opportunity that some do, some don't. But I want them all to get to the end of their four years and look back at this and just be like, man, that was awesome. That was amazing of all these things that I got to do, all these experiences that I got to have, all these places I got to travel, all of these people I got to meet at places like Clark. And it wouldn't happen without the support of the 12th Man Foundation, the people that are supporting that and the individual donations to the programs. Coach Morrison, going back to, let's talk about your debut season when you came in to Texas A&M and you led the volleyball program to its first NCAA tournament since 2019. Yep. It's 26th appearance in program history. What did you instill that first year? What were your priorities in terms of culture when you inherited the program? Yeah, I think that year one is hard. I think one, I I tried to present what our culture was going to be at the beginning. And I'm big on setting expectations for people of what's going to happen so that they have the opportunity to opt in. I recruit probably a different way, for example. And with all of our recruits, I've gone through, these are the things I'm going to demand of you every single day. And I did that very early on with this group so that people could opt in and say like, hey, he warned us that he was going to hold people accountable to body language. He warned us that he's going to force you to work hard in these seven different ways. And that way it's not this retroactive, like we're going back. So we really talked, and I think every coach should do this. Every business owner should do this. I'm a big Patrick Lencioni fan. For those of you that haven't heard of him, he wrote Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's my book on culture, but like all of his books are good. He has two podcasts. I adhere to him. But he talks about core values. And when I was in the Netherlands, I had a team manager that was a behavioral psychologist that worked in advertising. And he always talked about what behavior are you trying to change? These are the five behaviors that I'm going to hold you accountable to every single day. We'll put a name behind them. But these are the five uh, behaviors that I'm going to hold you accountable to. And we really kind of outline those. And then it's being consistent with them. And consistency every single day of that, of, hey, hard work for me is if someone shanks the ball, the whole team is going to chase it down. And if we don't do it, we're going to watch video of it. And we're going to go over that over and over again. And it's going to change. Or you're going to get, and this is where Patrick Lynch you know, goes to with core values, or you're going to get really uncomfortable and you're not going to be here. Like on your, like you're going to get uncomfortable. And you're in, I, I think it was a little bit of that of, hey, these are the things that we hold true. We're going to hold them true every single day. And I think athletes also, like we, do, we do a drill in our gym where basically we just hold them accountable for two minutes. And that's their favorite drill. Like athletes want to be held accountable as long as they know what they're going to be held accountable to. So I think it was setting the standard for these are the things that we're going to hold you accountable to, but we're not going to be wishy-washy and change them every single day so that you feel psychologically safe to come to practice, to be yourself, to work hard. And I always say like teams, when I have a team where they're at their best, if they do something that we're going to hold them accountable to, they're just looking over at me and I just have to say, yeah, you know, and I know, go change it. And I think we're getting to that point now in year two, but I think that was year one of, hey, the very beginning, we sat down, I think our first or second meeting was a two-hour presentation of like, 
here's video example of what we're going to hold you accountable to. Here's me describing it. Here's what these things, here's our expectations when it comes back to getting back to a food order and things like those. So it was really setting the rules of like, here, here's the lines not to cross, but here's the, mission, like the area where you can go play and have fun and enjoy yourself and feel safe. That's awesome. It's a really good book, The Five Dysfunctions of Oh, it is. I highly yes. recommend it. We've talked to Afina Kosopala, and she mentioned that your approach to blocking has just changed her game and her whole perspective. And I know you have an innovative style. So can you speak to that a little bit? I think for me, there's some, some layers to things. I think one, an athlete needs to trust their body's ability to get from A to B fast enough to go be a good blocker. So for those that know our sport, Afina is a middle blocker. She has to travel from the middle of the court, which is 15 feet in, and go probably about 10 feet in both directions based on what the setter does across the net. So you got to be efficient enough and strong enough. Like you got to get in the weight room and make sure that you're able to move your body quick enough to get those distances. So it's training for us, for the middle blockers, it's really two different footwork patterns of like, hey, here's, I guess, three different footwork patterns. Here's what to do when you have a lot of time. Here's what to do. You have a medium amount of time. Here's what to do when you don't have a lot of time and get an athlete's body to trust those because the next step is training yourself not to guess. We as human beings don't like to be wrong. So, and that just in volleyball, if you have a 50-50 chance of being wrong, oftentimes you're going to start to guess so that you're right 50% of the time. And it's just something weird that our brain does. So it's, hey, are you efficient enough to move side to side? Can you be disciplined enough to stay in here and read what's going on? And then the third step is, can I read? Can I get my eyes? And you can look at every different sport. Our eyes need to go to the right spot and everything. If you're in football, uh, depending on what position you're at, like, I don't know, if you're a quarterback, you're scanning coverages. Uh, if you're a defensive back, you're watching probably I'm guessing I'm not an expert in these but you're you're watching the wide receiver and then you're trying to get the quarterback size if you're in basketball you're watching the core of the body to see what's going on and in our sport it's whatever the next actor is so for them it's really getting a look at the setter and seeing what's going on and can I pick up on tells of what they're going to do and then it's putting all those three things together and for her it was she's fast dynamic it was can we get her to stay in the middle of the court and be disciplined in this thing and then I'd say the next layer on top of it which is making her pretty special right now is what we do with our hands just that these are the things that tell the ball where to go. And she's done a really good job of when I'm reaching outside my body, how do I turn this back in and get a side? And this year, even better than last year, but how do I get the soft touch that comes back this way? Or how do I get this thing so it ricochets back to the end line or straight down or do these things that can do some pretty unique things with her hands? So um, it's kind of that pattern and, and get into that. And then can we talk about some different situations where we can take advantage of knowing what's going to happen? And she's getting there this year where we can start to play some games now because we're disciplined. So. Happy she said that. Thank you. Yeah. Makes and I've, I've watched matches. I mean, her, Logan, just incredible yeah. on the net. Yeah. Incredible. And I pulled those two aside at one point. Like, And we do some stuff with rhythm, too, and some noise and sound and some stuff. that like and I think blocking is a little bit of a dance that people need to be in the right place at the right time. And the two people have to have a similar like footwork and cadence to what they're doing. So I pulled them aside at one point. Like, There's just times in a match where I can tell like the rhythm of it's there and they're lining up. And I'm like, this is going to be a block. And I'm like, sure enough, there's a block. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. Let's go back to the sport psychology aspect of volleyball. I mean, I played in high school, taking me back, and I'm remembering the game of volleyball, and I miss it a lot some days. But I feel like volleyball is a game of prediction, right? Like you said, yeah. you're trying to read. And yep. so tell us more about the psychology aspect of it and how you coach your team. Yeah. The sports psychologists I referred to that sat down in Mexico on the bench, there were two of them that really had a huge impact on the way that I see things. Uh, three of them, actually, I take that back. The first one uh, was Ken Revisa, who we brought in with the men's national team. And we'd brought in sports psychologists before that were like, you're an elephant, you're a giraffe. And we had like 32-year-old men being like, who did you bring into this gym? And Ken was the first person that came in, like, you guys are going to go to the Olympics. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be there and there's going to be 40 million people watching on TV. And everyone's like, like oh, you can see the room kind of get quiet. And he's like, and you're going to get a little tight. And everyone's like, yeah, you're probably right. And he's like, I'm here to get you a little less tight. And it was just this first time we've ever had a real like, hey, this is hard. Like spending four years of your life going to do this thing, getting this one opportunity to go in a medal. It's the only thing that everyone pays attention to. And if anybody's watching and they're casual like Olympics fans, like I just encourage you watch some of the other stuff that leads up to it. That is the tip of the iceberg that you see. And again, world championships for volleyball is the harder one. If you want the best volleyball, go watch that. But everyone watches this one event. So there's all this pressure. And he's like, I'm here to try to get you to loosen up by 4%. And I've really gotten on that. Like when I talk, one of that core, like but that first presentation I give, like one of our core tenants is to understand discomfort, is not to be comfortable being uncomfortable. It's to understand that, like, hey, when you're uncomfortable, they're usually uncomfortable. The ref's uncomfortable. People in the stands are uncomfortable. Our job is just to be 1% less uncomfortable than the people across the net. And we really try to word it that way that we're just trying to loosen this up a little bit. And I think there's some skills that come along with that. So when I was working with Michael Trevay, uh, who is our sports psychologist, that again sat next match. He made it just very practical of like, hey, here's these skills you have to have. 
here's how we train confidence. Like it, and everyone thinks, oh, I just, like, these people are just confident. It's like, no, you have done the work to back up the confidence. Like that is number one. Like, hey, I have positive self-talk. How can I reframe that? Can I have mindfulness? Can I do some mindfulness and meditation? Um, about, I don't know, half a practice is we'll do a five minute meditation at the end. And the goal of that is to catch yourself slipping from where it is that you want your mind to be. Can we clearly define who I want to be as a volleyball player, as a competitor? Like, what do I look like? What do I sound like? What do I feel like? What is my dialogue on the inside when I'm playing at my best? And can I catch myself when I'm slipping away from that and bringing it back? One of the things, and I got to do this right now because we have a large upperclassman group that I sit down and I want to do it. I might do it this week. Thank you for the reminder. Is do a personal mission statement of like, who do I want to be as a human being? Because again, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to leave this program and some of us are going to be athletes. All of us are going to be human beings. But what are my values? What do I want to try to emulate? How do I want to leave my mark on the world? And catch, can I catch myself when I'm slipping from that, bring myself back? So there's all these real world skills that can be taught around this optimism, all of these things. And Michael Drive was the one who kind of opened my eyes to that. And then I would say the third one is Bernie Holiday. I was over, uh, Kim was working at Pittsburgh um, with her volleyball program for a little bit. And he works with her volleyball program. And he was the one that made it real world to me. Whereas Michael would talk about it, Bernie would find a way to hold people accountable to it on the volleyball court or hold people accountable to it in life or give these real world examples where I can practice this. And, and Michael did too. Like, for example, like we talk about finding your five. Uh, we've been talking about that a lot for the last two weeks of like us as human beings, we don't operate best at a one where we're half asleep. This is in any phase of life. So if anybody's anything else, we don't operate at a 10 where we're walking into a business meeting and we're shaking. We operate best in the middle of that where we're, like, we're tuned into, hey, this is important. So I'm not at a one, but I'm right at a five. And uh, I remember Gervais, the first time he's like, here, I recommend this. He's like, if you're single, I wouldn't do this if you're married. I just encourage you to walk up to a complete stranger and give them a compliment on something about them. And he's like, your heart rate will get up. You'll get to a nine and then just find a way to bring yourself back to a five. But he, like, he would find little ways to make that real also. But it wasn't just this thing that we talked about anymore. It was this thing that we can do that we can hold people accountable to every single day. And I think the combination of those have really like molded me into how do we teach skills so that they're performed best at 14, 14 in a fifth set. How do we talk about things and use language that's going to get that? What skills can we teach to help our athletes bring themselves down to a five in those moments? So we talk about it a lot within our program. That's so interesting. It's basically like you either control your emotions or you're controlled by your emotions. Yep, 100%. And, and taking captive of those those feelings, 100%. those moments. So you can excel and thrive in moments of pressure or moments where in the game is on, right? Yep. And that's what we're doing this for. Like everyone can teach someone to, to play their best when things aren't on the line. It's say hey, when things get down to that moment, can I be myself? I don't need to be more than it, but can I be myself in that moment is really, really important. Coach Morrison, I also want to get your perspective on name, image, and likeness <laughs> and its impact. What's that? Yeah. It sounds familiar, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, want to get your perspective on that and its impact on the student athlete experience here at Texas A&M. Yeah. I think our athletes should be compensated for, for us using their image to help the university in some ways. So I am a full proponent of our athletes having access to getting to do this. Where we're trying to do it differently as a program is I really want to teach how to use that money. And for me, I didn't learn this until I was 35, to generate wealth for them down the road. That it's not just we're giving them money to go spend on something, is that we're giving them money and we're teaching them how to put it somewhere that it can be working for them, that they have a nest egg by the time they leave college. I gave a 45 minute, and again, this has become near and dear to my heart. I've done a lot of studies on, again, my, this is my accounting background coming back and business side coming back right here. But I talked to our girls about budgeting last year and tied it into the time value of money and talked about, hey, if you were to put this amount of money away per year, this is what you would have at the end. And I talked about free money. I talked about, hey, like this is how to make your money work for you and leave here with more and have that generate into something to the point where you can have generational wealth that you can pass on to your kids, that you can do these things that we can get our athletes ahead because of this thing. So I'm all for it. I think it's something our athletes deserve. I think it's going to change the landscape here very, very quickly. I think everyone's heard of how college athletics is going to change and we don't know how it's shifting, but I want to make sure it's done in the right way. Uh, I want to make sure our athletes are given the resources to necessary to go make that money work for them, that they can leave here and buy a business and be their own business owner if they want to, or they can invest in the stock market and understand how that works, or they can go buy a house when they're done with this. I just want to make sure it's used in the right way by the time they leave. I completely agree. And I feel like we've talked to several coaches too, and I feel like there's an alignment with a lot of the coaches and how they want the athletes to be handling their NIL earnings. And yep. they, they want them to have the resources and the education that will set them up for success yep. in that realm. Yep. So it's always interesting to hear y'all's perspective. Yeah. And I think the other side of it too, just we need to stay competitive. And I, I tell all of our recruits whenever I'm bringing someone into a program, like I never want somebody to come into this program for money. 
I want them to come to this program because of the values that we're going to instill in them by the time we leave. And hey, here's this thing. We're going to stay competitive with everybody else. We're going to make sure you're not going somewhere else for that reason. Um, and probably want them to choose the university as well from an education standpoint. Like, this is a great place to 100%. get an education yeah. as well. No, it's the education piece. It's the culture piece. It's we're going to develop you as a human being and a volleyball player piece. Like, all of these things are so much more important. And in our sport, I don't think anybody's making any decisions for money. And I don't think it's like, oh, that program has a great NIL program. I'm going to go there. I don't think it's fully gotten there yet. And I think it might one day. And I really hope it doesn't. I think our, our sport's pretty pure in a lot of ways. But I'd like to keep it that way. But again, mm-hmm. we need to stay competitive. Biggest thing. So to wrap up today, Coach Morrison, reflecting on your your past and your career path and now being at Texas A&M and looking forward to the future of Aggie Volleyball, what excites you the most? What do you look forward to? Um, We did a staff retreat and talked about why we do this. And again, I haven't been here long enough. I actually just sent a text to Caroline Muth today, actually, uh, who graduated from here, is playing professionally in Switzerland right now. But I think it's having athletes that have graduated from here. I went to a couple Hall of Fame things and Lori Corbelli just got inducted and just watching her players just show up for her and like getting to be a piece of our kids' lives when they graduate is number one. Like I don't really have that yet. I have the grind of being in this and the winning piece and all these things and developing human beings while they're here, but I just, I can't wait to have my first player have their kid and be able to reach out and be like, man, I'm so fired up for you to be a parent right now. Like I'm so excited for this and I hope this experience prepared you for that experience. So I think that's the long term that like we told it four for 40 that we bring program players in, we keep them here for four years and that we be a part of their lives for 40. I think I have that much time left on my clock. Uh, we'll see if I take care of myself a little bit better, maybe a little bit longer. And then I think this idea that we're just getting started, like first tournament appearance in a long time. And I think we're on track to do that this year and more. And I, I just, I feel like the programs on this rise that I saw it being on of just, where can we get it? Of we had 9,200 people at a match. Can I fill it up with 13,000? How far can we take it? And that kind of openness and vastness is a little bit daunting but at the same time it's really exciting because i see this trajectory that we're on and if we can keep it on it we're going to go do some special things so i think it's that idea of the near term of like where can we get this program and in the long term like i really i don't know i'm getting chills as i think about this like again our first player to have a kid and to be able to send them a onesie and be like man like i'm so excited for you to have this experience that changed all of our an lives aggie as parents. Onesie, right? yeah, exactly an aggie onesie so i think it's a combination of those two things Coach Morrison on Answering the Call podcast. Coach Morrison, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Answering the Call, the official podcast of the 12th Man Foundation. A special shout out to our incredible podcast producer, Megan Hoffman, and to 12th Man Productions for their generous use of the studio. We also extend our heartfelt gratitude to every donor and season ticket holder for always answering the call through loyal support of Texas A&M Athletics and our student-athletes. We will be back soon with more content. Thanks and get going.